Good morning, everyone. We come now once again to Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, last week we looked just at the concept of the Old and the New Covenant, and today we'll get into the first half of the chapter uh, as we take some time to jump to some of the words of Paul and see how he interprets some of the things that Jeremiah says here in chapter 31. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that our eyes would be open to your word, uh, that it would fill our hearts and our minds and our lives so that we would live it out to your glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So chapter 31, at that time. Now, at that time, that's what, how it starts. If What time is that? We have to look back at the end of chapter 30. Uh, in the latter days, you will understand that. Um, so when is that? Well, that's, as we said last week, that is sometime in the future. Now, for, for the people of Judah at this point, and that is the restoration, that's the bringing them back, uh, and it has its ultimate fulfillment in a threefold fashion under the work of Christ. His coming, the living out of the kingdom by the body of Christ in this world, and then, of course, his return brings it all to fulfillment. So when he says, at that time, declares the Lord, that's the ultimate fulfillment of these things. Um, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. So Jeremiah is describing here the day when uh, all of true Israel will return to God and uh, will be saved. Now, what does that mean? Well, we have to look, and then we're going to turn over to Romans chapter 11 uh, to see how Paul interprets this for us and gives us a pretty good understanding of what this passage means and what he means uh, when he talks about all Israel being saved. Now, I'm going to look at first... Um, Romans chapter 9, for there are actually two passages, Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 11. So Romans chapter 9, uh, verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Uh, this means it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. <clears throat> so what Paul is saying here, really in chapters uh, 9, 10, and 11 of Romans, he's describing what the Lord is going to be doing in the future uh, for the Jews. And he has described um, uh, pretty clearly in, in these passages um, the grafting in of the Gentiles into the uh, line of the promise um, and what that means. Uh, so in a sense, he's put the Jews on hold until the full number of Gentiles come into the kingdom. But when we look at chapter 11, verse 26, which is the other passage, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. Um, so that's, there's the question of what does Paul mean there by all Israel? Um, and referring back to our passage from Jeremiah, what does that mean at the time of the restoration? Um, it's not just that time after 70 years when they'll return from exile, but it is that time of the fulfillment in those days. Well, there's certainly a distinction between ethnic or natural Israel and spiritual Israel. Uh, Abraham, we see that in Abraham's life, we see that in the descendants, uh, the line of the promise, and, and all those things makes it very clear. So there are a couple different understandings of what it means that all Israel will be saved. Some maintain that all Israel refers to all the spiritual Israel, including the Jews and the Gentiles, that would be spiritual Israel. Others suggest that all Israel refers to the elect of the natural descendants of Abraham. Um, that would be remnant uh, theology, so to speak. Others contend the meaning of Israel, all Israel, is the nation of Israel. Uh, that would be all ethnic Israel. 
Another view is that this verse refers to a point in time when there will be a mass conversion among the Jews. And Paul's point in this chapter is that although they have been obstinate, this is chapter 11, they've been obstinate, the Lord will overcome that uh, and that um, he has not fully rejected the Jews. And Paul uses himself as an example as he was really the best of his nation uh, and how the Lord called him. However we interpret that phrase, all Israel will be saved, we understand that it is only those who embrace Jesus Christ by faith that will be saved. So whoever is saved, Jew or Gentile, they, they come to the Heavenly Father through Christ alone. Um, so does this mean that at some point all ethnic Israel will be saved, all ethnic Israel will come to Christ? Um, no, I don't see that in Scripture, but we do see that all those who are who belong to the Lord, whom he will save, they will come to Christ and they will be saved. Let's go back in chapter 11, just a few passages, a few verses to 1123. And even if they do not continue in their unbelief, and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. Uh, we've seen that the Gentiles were, in a sense, grafted into the olive tree of the Jews. Uh, and the Jews were then put on hold. Now it should be no great work for God to regraft them into their own tree, so to speak. Verse 24, for if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree. And he's talking about the Jews who will believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So it's very clear that as, as Paul describes it, there is one church. There is one body of Christ. There are not two ways of salvation. There are not two groups, two churches. There is one body of Christ Westminster Confession of Faith emphasizes this in chapter 25 very clearly as it says the Catholic or universal church which is invisible that's the invisible church the church that only Christ knows consists of the whole number of the elect that have been are or shall be gathered into one under Christ the head thereof and is the spouse and body and fullness of him that fill us all and all. So the people of God, the church, consists of all of God's people throughout all generations, both of those who have gone before, who are part of it now, and who shall be in the future. And we're all brought into one body, that is the body of Christ. And God, as Paul says here, will keep his promises to his people. So let's uh, continue here um, in verse 26. And this is the way all Israel will be saved. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. The deliverer obviously is Christ. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now Paul is talking about uh, this mystery here that will be revealed. And most things are a mystery until God reveals them. And then we go, oh, why didn't I see that before? Um, so God keeps certain things hidden from our regular knowledge, so to speak, our human knowledge and our human eyes. But it's not until the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to what Scripture means that we understand the mystery of Israel's salvation, as Paul is talking about it here in chapter 11. So that gives us a little insight into an explanation of what Jeremiah is talking about here in chapter 31 as Paul is pointing to its fulfillment um, through the work of Christ. So let's go back now uh, to chapter 31 of Jeremiah, verse 2. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness when Israel sought for rest the Lord appeared to him from far away I have loved you with an everlasting love 
Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. He, he, uh, Charles, I'm going to quote Charles Spurgeon here. He says, it is not I have pitied thee, nor have I thought about thee, but I have loved thee. So this is spoken about Israel, but it also describes all who are loved by the Lord. Um, now think about this for a moment as we tie in again what Paul says to the church at Ephesus. Think of God's love for us. Well, usually we think about it as, as our, our current situation, or we think about it as uh, our time of salvation. But that goes back before your birth, before your conception. It goes back before Calvary, before Bethlehem. It goes back before Abraham, before the fall in the garden, because Paul says, you were chosen in Christ before the foundations of the world. That is the extent of the love of our Heavenly Father as it is talked about here, both in the works of Paul and also here in chapter 31 of Jeremiah. I loved you with an everlasting love. It is a love that we don't fully understand because our love really in this world is it's a temporal love. Um, it has a beginning and an end. But the love of God does not. And if he chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world, before we were created, before the world was even created, that is the extent of the love of God. It has no start because God has no beginning, and it has no end because God is eternal. So it is the loving kindness of the Lord that draws us unto him. Now this loving kindness, well, that's kind of a famous Hebrew word, the hesed, uh, it takes more than really one word to describe it because it is vast, it is beyond all measure, it is a love we don't understand, it is the love that is particular to God, it is a covenant love that draws us. Um, and it, it's interesting, Spurgeon once again says, the loving of kindness draws Israel, penitents, those who are repentant, are drawn to Christ rather than driven away from Christ. So we think of people who might come to us who are penitent, and we uh, in our humanness might uh, want a pound of flesh out of them because of what they've done wrong to us. But it's the love of Christ that draws the penitents and keeps them, and they find healing and life in that love. Verse 4, again, I will build you and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. It's God's loyal love that means he, re will, he will restore Israel. He will build them up. Uh, this is a, a time of joy, a time of rejoicing. Again, you shall adorn yourself with tambourines. You shall go forth in the dance of merrymaking as an example of their joy uh, and overflowing. Uh, you shall plant vineyards on the mountain of Samaria. They shall enjoy the fruit, for there shall be a day when watchmen will call in the hill country of Ephraim, Arise, let us go up to Zion to the Lord of, to the Lord of our God. Usually watchmen are there for the enemies. Well, here the watchmen are looking for the joy. They're looking for the Lord. They're looking for that, that time where they can call out, Let's all go. Let's all rejoice. Um, here come the pilgrims who are coming to the Lord. Uh, it will be a very different time than the people are experiencing now um, as the final days of before the last crowd will be destroyed and, and the remnants taken off into the final exile to Babylon. Verse 7, For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, Raise shouts for the chief of the nations, proclaim, give praise, say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Um, so this is good news that so should not be heard just in Israel alone, but for all nations. Because remember, it, it, Jeremiah has said previously, those pagan nations will walk by Jerusalem and hiss and click their tongues and shake their heads and go, how did you fall? You had everything. And then, as we look down in the future, this is good news, the restoration of Israel, 
the, the, the final fulfillment of all the promises of the Lord. He says, Behold, I will bring them from the north country, gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the pregnant woman, and she who is in labor together, a great company, they shall return here. Um, so this is not just a returning to the Lord. This is actually references a physical return to the land. Now, this was not fulfilled in 1948. Uh, although some people think it was, I do not hold that view. They returned to the land in unbelief. They returned to the land as those who said, we've got our property back. They didn't return to the land and to the Lord in faith. That day is yet to come. Um, Israel, is, is large part, is still a secular Jewish society. Um, there aren't that many Jewish uh, people who've become believers in Israel um, but there will be a day when the gospel will go forward and there will be a harvest there. So they shall come weeping um, with pleas of mercy. I will lead them back. I'll make them walk by brooks of water, a straight path, on and on and on. These are the latter days referred at the end of chapter 34 when the Lord returns, or when the people return to the Lord through the work of the Messiah. Christ. I'll pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me whom they've pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn from the prophet Zechariah chapter 12. Ephraim is mentioned here in this last little section here. My firstborn Ephraim represents Israel as a whole. Um, as as uh, it's, it's significant, Ephraim was not the firstborn of Jacob, yet God often regarded him as in mentioning him in that fashion. Um, so let's continue verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. He who scattered Israel will gather him. This is proclaimed to all the nations. This is a gathering again in the the last days, whenever they will be. They ransomed him from one who is stronger. Um, God has promised to rescue his people from captivity, uh, from bondage, from those who are stronger, or from him who is stronger. Uh, we might say that might refer to the clutches of uh, the God of this world, Satan, um, or, or both are natural or spiritual blindness redeemed and ransomed those are two very important verbs um, ransom often refers to the paying off of a price to redeem someone and redeemed is often used in the context of family obligations as in a kinsman redeemer and and probably that was seen uh, best in the old testament in the life of boaz and Christ is also referred to in that fashion as well. In the Old Testament, uh, a kinsman redeemer was one that was supposed to uh, redeem his relative's property out of debt and restore that land. Um, so uh, that's the kind of idea that we get redeemed and ransom. They shall come and sing in the height of Zion. So again, Lots of rejoicing at this time. Verse 13. Then shall the young woman rejoice and dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I'll turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will feast the soul of the priest with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. A time of rejoicing to such a degree, it says here, the priest... I will feast the soul of the priest with abundance. Now, you remember the priest, the Levites, um, uh, worked in the temple, and they were supported, in a sense, by the rest of the nation. So the nation will be so abundant that the offerings to the temple, so to speak, will be overflowing. 
uh, that is such of the day of abundance. Um, and then we come to this uh, last section, which we'll stop uh, as, just as we touch on this one and, and pick up the rest of the chapter next week. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Now, uh, we remember this from both uh, last week and we, as we referenced it and in Matthew chapter 2, uh, how this passage is referenced. Uh, Ramah is that spot that's right on the border between that town, right on the border between Israel and Judah, the northern and southern kingdoms, um, and was the staging area both for the Assyrians and the Babylonians to take people off into captivity. Uh, Rachel is seen as the mother of both the northern and the southern kingdoms, and it is her weeping uh, because her children are no more. They've been taken off into captivity. Um, verse 16, keep your voice from weeping, your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of, enemy, of the enemy. There is hope for your future, and your children shall come back to their own country. This is the promise in those days or in the latter days, as Jeremiah is saying, when the people will return, and they will just not return physically, they will return through faith in Jesus Christ. How many will have faith? That is unknown. But those whom the Lord has determined, the elect, they will come to Christ, and it will be great days of rejoicing as those who have sought the Messiah as a people finally see the fulfillment that they haven't been able to see so far, the fulfillment of their hopes and the promises of the Lord in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So we'll pick up there next week. So I'll see you then.